As you are seated, I encourage you to find a copy of God's Word as we should always be in the Word of God. And this morning, that has us in at least two places in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. And then we're also going to be moving on over into the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. Very familiar passage there. Brand new series that we are beginning together this morning. We're willing to ask hard questions. And maybe the questions themselves aren't necessarily so hard, uh, but sometimes it's the answer that we are not uh, uh, necessarily willing to receive in the moment. But we want to ask these questions of God and have God give us the answers so that our confidence may increase, but that our witness would increase as well um, to those who do not yet know Christ as both Savior and Lord. Amen, church? And that is where we will be over these next weeks together. But first of all, we pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the authority of your word. We thank you for the inspiration of your word that it tells us about and it leads us to your one and only son, Christ Jesus. Through Christ alone is our salvation accomplished. So Father, have us to know, have us to love, have us to believe this word and to live it out well for your glory, for our good and as a witness to those not yet walking with Christ. And we pray it all in his name. Amen. And as is probably typical of many parents, my mom and dad parented in different ways. My dad was a man of a few words. His answers during much of life were, were always quite short. But when it came to Um, Being a parent, when it came to disciplining boys, uh, instead of using words, he would just kind of look at us. Do you know anybody who has that look? It's as if they have these eyes that that can just see right into your soul. And and if you weren't feeling guilty before, you feel guilty now. And, And dad had that look, and that's how he parented. But mom, on the other hand, Um, parented with words. Um, Mom rarely came up to take a breath because she was normally instructing us with words. This is what you need to do. This is what you shouldn't do. Now, this is how you need to do it. No, you shouldn't do it this way. Here, let me tell you one more time how to do it. Talk, talk, talk. I'm so glad I'm not like my mom, right? (laughs) But she parented with words. And so some of you parent with the look, some of you parent with with words. Those are two ways that that we can parent. But mom was was parenting one day, my brother Todd and and, and myself, and and, and she was calling to us and we were in another room. And, And having listened to her calling us repeatedly, we just decided, you know what? We really don't feel like answering mom. Have you ever had children who just kind of ignore you for a while? But we just decided we're not going to respond to mom and we're not going to go see what she wants. And and yet all of a sudden there are some parents who have an ability to just be there. And all of a sudden there she was with with her hands on her hips. And she looked at Todd and she looked at me and she said, all right, we're going to do this one more time. I'm going to tell you what to do. And that's the moment when I remember hearing my brother Todd say, How about no? And he lived to survive. (laughs) We'll finish that story again some other time. but, But let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever said no to authority? How many of you have have been under authority? You're you're existing within the structure of authority, but you like to question that authority. You like to say no. You like to find and bump right up against the edge of that authority, and you like to see if you can just go a little bit outside of it or just a little bit beyond it. You like to test authority. or, Or is there anyone here who feels like you are the authority figure? You're that person, you are those people, and and yet your authority is always being questioned. You feel like people are working against you. You feel like folks are trying to undermine you. You feel like people don't believe you for some reason. How do you respond to 
authority? Well, that's a very good question. Maybe it's a hard question. We profess to be followers of Christ Jesus. We profess to be those women and, and those men who are disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. And as such, we are called to live under the authority of Scripture. Say that with me. The authority of Scripture. How are we doing? Living under the authority of Scripture. The fullness of of God's word, how are we doing? Do we just accept the authority of God's word and, and what it says and how it leads and, and what it tells us? We are good by the power of the Holy Spirit and we've surrendered every aspect of our lives living under the authority of, of the word of God or, or are we struggling? Are we struggling to see why this word is so authoritative? Are we struggling to see why this word has, has such power? Are we struggling to understand why is this word raised up above all other words? Are, are you struggling under its authority? And, and maybe you've said out loud, how about no? Where are you at? We're going to take this morning and Lord willing next week Sunday to, to look at the authority of God's word. This morning to lay some groundwork of, of the word's authority. And next week, believing that authority together, we're going to see how living under it should, in the best ways, interrupt and interfere in our lives. Amen, church? Agree? Amen? All right. So as we begin this morning, number one, the authority of God's word, we are going to start out, first of all, with creation. Say that with me. Creation. I want you to consider the authority of God's word at that very moment of creation. Because the very act of creation itself involves God speaking. It involves God speaking and using his words. So you're right there, Genesis chapter 1 at verse 1. Listen to God's word. We're told, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said... Say those three words with me. Together we say, and God said. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is God speaking. This is God speaking at that moment of creation. This is God with, with words over and over again. That week of creation, the fullness of those six days. This is God displaying his authority. This is God displaying his power. This is God displaying his strength and his might as his plan is unfolding. This is God who speaks at creation and he brings forth every single environment and every single habitat. This is God who, who hangs the sun and the moon and the stars in their courses above of which we sing. This is God who after every environment and habitat has been made then introduces the plants and the vegetation and the animals. Those things that fly above, those things that swim in the sea, those things that creep and crawl and walk upon the ground. At creation, it is the word of God with authority and power and might. And yet what happens on, 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 on day six of creation? What do we hear God doing? Move down there in chapter one, all the way down to verse 26. Scripture tells us, then God said, he's still speaking. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then just a couple lines down, verse 27 picks up. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the word of God, the authority of God, the power of God. That, that in this very moment, he creates men and women in his image. We are created to be the very image bearers of God. And he gives us privilege, he gives us responsibility over his creation. 
Jumping back in at verse 26, and he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Wow. This is our God. This is our God who speaks with authority and power and strength and might. And look at what he brings forth. Look at what he does. And then further down at verse 28, we have the blessing of God. Say that with me, the blessing of God. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Wow. He speaks. Word of God, speak. And with authority, and with power, and with strength, and with might. We we see the earth. We see the entirety of, of the heavens and the universe brought forth. And we see God creating us in his image, male and female. We see God blessing us. We see God establishing his relationship with us. We see that gift of marriage between a man and a woman. We hear his instruction to be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the earth as he gives that dominion instruction. Wow. Church, can you say amen? This is our God. And when it comes to his word, it it shows us his authority and his power and his strength and his might and this and this most important of relationships that he that he would have relationship with us. And invite us in in this relationship with him. And how important is is that relationship? How important? God warns the man and the woman In an effort to guard this relationship, God God warns them in chapter 2, verse 17, if you need to to turn the page. Genesis 2, verse 17, God warned them and and said, But of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall what? Surely die. In that moment of creation, The word of God, the gift of life, image bearers, blessed, relationship with him, marriage, children, dominion. Wow. And God says, look out for this one thing. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat that fruit, you will surely die. His word is very clear. And yet there are always those who want to question the word of God. There's always those who want to push against the authority of God's word. They want to, uh, number two, have a conversation. Say that with me, a conversation. Hey, can we talk about what God supposedly said? Hey, can we talk about the word of God? I'm wondering if you're willing to have a, a little dialogue. There's always those folks who want to have a conversation about the word of God. Not a conversation that would bring us to a greater acceptance of the word, but a conversation that is designed to have us doubt and distrust the word of God. And it doesn't surprise us, the one who introduced this conversation in Genesis 3 at verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Of course. Who is the first one to question the authority of God's word? (laughs) Who's the first one to doubt the authority of God's word? Who's the first one to say, hey, can we have a conversation? Can, Can we talk about the authority of God? This is Satan 
who does not want God having all the authority. He does not want God having all the worship and the praise. He does not want God to be the only one who calls the shots. He does not want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Satan is working against God. You see, Satan wants a throne for himself. Satan wants to have the decisions fall under him. Satan wants a little bit of this power. Isaiah paints a picture for us of this Satan. The prophet Isaiah tells us in, in chapter 14 of that book by the same name, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Satan wants to be like God. Satan wants to, to have a portion of this authority. Satan wants to have a portion of this power. Satan wants to be able to, to establish his own steps. And so he says, can we have a conversation? Can, can, can we talk about God? Can we talk about his word, please? And you know what? When, whenever folks try to have these conversations, they are not interested in accurately reading the Word of God. They are not interested in clearly reading the Word of God. They will skip words. They will add words. They will manipulate words. They will take things out of context. They'll do whatever they can to create doubt in this conversation. And that's exactly what Satan does. You continue there in verse 1. He he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of what? Any tree? Did God actually say you shall not eat of, of any tree in the garden? <laughs> Satan is already misquoting the word of God. Did God say that you may not eat from any tree in the garden? All trees are off limit. And of course, Eve answers the question. She, no, that's not what God said. God said that we may, we may not eat from the tree of the knowledge of, 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 of good and, and, and evil. But you see, Satan is trying to, to paint a picture of God. He's saying, you know what? Are, are you sure you want to live under God's authority? Are you sure you want to live under, under the word of God? I mean, he's so restrictive. He's such a downer. All he does is tell you no, 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 no. I mean, does God ever provide or do anything good for you? Are you sure you want to live in, in such a cramped up life? Did God say that you cannot eat from any tree? And Eve says, no, 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 that's... That's not what, what he said. But, but Satan keeps on asking questions and Satan keeps the, the conversation rolling in that way to, to have him walk away from the authority of God's word. Finally landing here in verse 4 of chapter 3 of Genesis, but the serpent said to the woman, uh, you, uh, you, will not surely, uh, you will not surely die. Now, God said, if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, church, what's going to happen? We will die. Satan says, no, you won't. God, God's not going to follow through on that. God's not serious about that. Come on. It's just a little bit of fruit. Loosen up a little bit. Come on, dare to go outside the wall. Dare, dare to see the sunshine of day. Have a little fun. You're not going to die. It's not that serious to live outside the authority and the will and the best plan of God. And so they have this conversation. Have you ever had any of those conversations? People talking to you. And you say, well, you know what? I mean, that's just the Old Testament. You don't have to believe that part. I mean, really, the only thing you have to do is, is go to the New Testament. Jesus is just a really good guy, and you should kind of model your life after him. He teaches some pretty decent morals for today. Those would be really good to teach your kids. Jesus did not come to teach morality. Jesus came to perfectly fulfill the law and to suffer and to die in our place that we might be forgiven of our what? Our sin. 
And that Old Testament is a testimony to our sin. Satan says, you won't die. (laughs) Yeah, you will. Don't listen to those conversations. God's word is authoritative. It's powerful. He speaks in a moment of creation. He brings forth life. He creates us in his image, his image bearers in relationship. And yet immediately conversation begins, initiated by Satan. Conversation continues today. Is God that serious? Is God really going to punish us if we we go beyond his will? You know what the answer to that question is? Number three, chaos. Say that with me. Chaos. And what kind of chaos is it? It's the chaos of sin. You know what? The longer you stay in that conversation, the longer you entertain those thoughts, the longer you entertain those ideas, the longer you allow people to just whittle away at your trusting of the authority of God's word, your faith in the authority of God's word, the longer you give in to that, the more likely you are to give in to temptation. And giving in to temptation leads to sin. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. They saw the fruit and they ate. In chapter 3, we're going to start reading at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be Desired to make one wise. You see, she's been listening to the whole conversation. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and and I ate. The whole thing blows up. The chaos of sin in that moment blows up. Satan, the serpent, had convinced them, come on, in this ongoing conversation, you can just have a little taste. You can just have a little bit. Life doesn't have to be so restrictive. Loosen up, enjoy yourself once in a while, as if lasting joy would come out of sin. And now the chaos of sin has been fully born and and they recognize their nakedness and they run and they hide. You see how this relationship with God is broken. God is walking in the cool of the garden. God's looking for them and they're hiding from God because they recognize their nakedness. They recognize their sin and God calls out to them. And when he does, what happens? The man blames God. The woman blames the serpent. Nobody wants to take responsibility. Nobody wants to be accountable. Nobody wants to say, you're right, it's my fault. I gave into temptation. I lingered in that conversation too long. It's on me, my bad. No. Nobody wants to be responsible. Nobody wants to be accountable. It's not my fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. And this chaos of sin causes all of creation to groan. God calls out the serpent. God calls out Satan. And he acknowledges that there's going to be this ongoing spiritual battle. But ultimately, he acknowledges that there will be that one who comes. That's the Messiah, the one and only Son of God, who will crush the head of Satan. But God looks and and the chaos of this sin is is going to impact 
childbearing. It's going to be painful. It's going to impact how we work, how we try to make ends meet, how we try to live. Work and labor is going to be hard. E even the earth is going to bring forth thorns and thistles. Life is hard. Life is broken. Life is not what God has created it or intended it to be. Why? Because they said no to God's authority. They said no to the authority and the power of God's word. His word at creation, clear. His word in conversation, distorted, manipulated, revised, and edited, spoken of in such a way to, to entice and tempt people to sin. And sin they did, bringing forth chaos upon all of creation. Wow. And you know what? You read, you read all of this Old Testament and you see how that chaos of sin spills over again and 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 again. For the thousands of years that followed that moment, sin has been shared from generation to generation. And the only way for that chaos to be made right, the only way for that sin to be dealt with is by Christ. Say that with me, by Christ, number four. Turn with me in the authority of God's word to 2 Timothy chapter three, turning towards the New Testament now. This is why we trust the authority of God's word. This is why we want to be under the authority and the instruction of God's word. It's why we want to continue to read it from beginning to end because we read of the chaos of our sin and our brokenness and this broken relationship with God, but we find the answer, we find the solution, we find the redemption in the New Testament and in the one who was promised throughout the old, that is Jesus Christ. You see, it is this singular word of God it's under the authority of this instruction that we are led to the way and truth and life that is Jesus Christ alone. It is Christ and only Christ who has shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might be forgiven today and have life everlasting with God, able to live out that victory here and now. Amen, church? And we have an older Paul who's speaking to a younger Timothy, reminding him of that right here in this passage. And Paul encourages Timothy with, with these words there at verse 15. He, he's telling him how from childhood, Timothy, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. He's like, Timothy, as, as, as long as you can recall, as long as you can remember, you've had the sacred writings. You've had what we know has the Old Testament. Your, your mom and your grandma, they were instructing you. And you know the authority of God's word. You know God's strength and power. You know how your life is broken. He says, you, you have, you've had the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Why do we trust the authority of God's word? Why do we trust what the word of God says? Because the word of God plainly and clearly points us to Christ alone. You cannot be forgiven any other way. There is no other way. There are no other means. You cannot live a good enough life. You cannot do enough good things. You cannot purchase a relationship with God. There is not some other scripture or truth or holy book that is out there that is going to lead you to Jesus Christ alone. He is the only one who was born, who lived a perfect life, who suffered and died upon a cross, who was buried, who on the third day by the power of the Holy Spirit rose from the dead, appeared to thousands, and then in their audience ascended to the glorious right hand of God the Father above. And from that position, 
he will return again to claim his own. Amen, church? And where do we learn that? In Scripture. How do we know that? Because the Word of God tells us so. This is why we trust the authority of this book. This book tells us of our need of salvation. Verse 15, it tells us of the only one who can provide that salvation for us, Christ Jesus. And having been provided that gift of Christ, believing, loving, receiving Christ as your Savior and your Lord, how do you then live under this authority? What power, if you surrender to it, what power and authority can, can this word have in our life? Well, fifthly, lastly for this morning, it, it provides for us context. Say that with me, context. It provides for us the context and the boundaries within which we live our lives. What context does this word provide? Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. As those redeemed, we live under its teaching. It tells us about God. And yet, in the midst of life, when we still give in to temptation, it reproves and it points out the ugly sin in my life. But it corrects. It has me to stand upright again. And then it goes further and it trains. It trains this life to live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, equipped for every good work. So maybe it's not a hard question. Maybe more difficult is the answer we have to give. Are you living under the authority and the power of God's word? You trust what it says. You believe what it says. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you desire to, to live out what it says every day of your life. That's the first question. How many of us are willingly living under this authority? Second question. How many of us not yet? How many of us may look, for the most part, like we're living under this authority? but we're actually giving in to conversations. And we're having the world whittle away at our faith, at our trust. And we're beginning to look at the word of God and in certain places say, no. Are you living under the authority of his word? Or are you giving into conversations based on lies? I pray we're a people who love the authority of his word. And Lord willing, when he brings us together next week, we're going to see how that word interrupts and interferes for all the right reasons in all the right places in our life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the authority of your word. We thank you that you spoke and you brought forth life, even our lives fearfully and wonderfully made. Father God, when the conversation led to temptation and sin, thank you for the answer already Jesus 
Jesus, thank you for going all the way to the cross that we might be forgiven of our sins. Holy Spirit, help us to live under the authority of this word, inspired, infallible, inerrant, teaching and showing us all that we need to know for our salvation and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.